Welcome back, one and all, to another episode of The Beginner's Guide to Genshin Lore. And today we'll be talking about Liwa. Liwa has the most cryptic, fragmented, and confusing history of any region released to date. And yes, I am including Enkanamiya in that. Now, in order to keep this video as accurate as possible, I've had to cut a lot of stuff. And the parts that were left, I've put together based on my best educated guess. Also, there will be instances where this video will not agree with the order of events presented on the Genshin Impact Wiki's timeline. That's okay, I am aware of these differences and they are intentional to a degree. The Wiki tries to stay as far away from speculations as possible, which is fantastic, but my goal with this video series is to create a cohesive narrative that's easy to remember, which means that sometimes my guesses are based on what would make logical sense for the characters and motivations and stuff instead of an authoritative source. Although this only applies when there is no authoritative source, because if there is one, then I will defer to that, obviously. Anyway, now you've probably already grasped this, but because this video is meant to be a gentle introduction into Liwa's lore, it is not at all comprehensive. It is only the important stuff, or the stuff that I feel like people want to know a little bit more about. And we will also not be covering the chasm at all here, except for like its initial creation, just for, you know, time referencing. The Chasm will get its own video, and likely that will include the entire Leisha region as well, because we're kind of gonna ignore that area for this video, so. Okay, excessively long disclaimer aside, my name is Ashikai, and this is a beginner's guide to Liwe. Our story begins over 6,000 years ago, when a god by the name of Morax was born. He was a half-dragon, half-chilin, illuminated beast known today as an Adepti. Now, the Adepti played a huge role in Liwa's culture and history, so it's important to understand who and what they were. Essentially, an Adepti is a label used to describe an animal or creature that has reached enlightenment. Through that enlightenment, they attain great wisdom, control over the elements, and even the ability to shift into a human form, though most prefer not to. Among the adeptal ranks are particularly ferocious illuminated beasts that wear monstrous masks known as the Yaksha. We will talk more about them later. Now, Morax himself was considered the prime of the Adepti, so he was basically like some kind of leader, although his exact role isn't clear. Now there is a gap of time between Morax's birth and the point at which he was assigned to Liwe, a 2,000 year gap at most, not at least, at most. At some point during that gap, a meteor fell from the sky and formed the chasm, a topic that will be covered in another video, but I wanted to mention it here just for context. Morax was likely assigned to the southernmost region of Liwe as his first recorded action was to raise Mount Tianhong. The mountain became his abode and humans began to congregate around it due to its plethora of natural resources and ore. Now here's the first assumption. These people who congregated at the mountain essentially founded Old Liwa Harbor, or at least a significant settlement in the nearby area. While they could have settled west of Mount Tianhong, it's unlikely because the second recorded act of Morax was when he quelled the seas. You see, his people were noted to suffer greatly at the hands of monsters that dwelled in the seas, so Morax created a giant whale out of rock to keep the monsters at bay but there was one behemoth monster that completely eluded him. This monster was known as Bachao, and it took the creation of a giant stone bird to subdue this mighty water dragon. I don't know why the bird was more effective than a whale when they're both made of rocks and just throwing rocks at the water, but okay, whatever works, I guess. You do you, Morax. Anyway, the point here is that the early settlements of Morax were likely in the same or very similar location of Liwa Harbor because if they were much farther inland, there would be no practical need for the people to actively challenge the seas. That only makes sense for a coastal settlement. End of my assumption. So all that was cool and life was great for a while. Big cool mountain full of resources, a calm ocean full of more resources and lots of yummy fishy food, and a really chilled dragon god. Life in old Liwa Harbor seemed pretty good. And then came Guizhong. Now Guizhong, if you don't know, was the goddess of dust. She wasn't very strong, and in fact, she's noted as being rather weak. 
but she was exceptionally brilliant, compassionate, and a very talented engineer with a love of machinery. She notably studied ancient war machines in her private domain in the Luhua Pool. Beyond that, we know next to nothing about her, including where she came from. However, well over 3,700 years ago, she met Morax in a field of glaze lilies, likely in Dihua Marsh, and she offered him an alliance of sorts. With her brains and his brawn, they could expand their territory and share the burden of rulership. Morax, being a bit of a brawny meathead, thought this was a pretty sweet deal, so he accepted. Guizhong then gave him a stone dumbbell called the Memory of Dust, which contained, you guessed it, the Memories of the Goddess of Dust. This token was meant to symbolize their promise of dual rulership. They called their alliance the Guili Assembly, and it was made up not of just Guizhong and Morax, but of several other adepti like Marcosius, who we now know today as Guoba. Morax's city of Old Liwa Harbor was able to expand northward into central Liwa in an area renamed the Guili Plains. Side note, the name Guili was actually a mashup of the two gods' names, Gui being the first character of Guizhong's name, and Li being the last character of whatever the name Morax was going by at the time, which was probably Zhongli, because why would it be anything else? So, ancient god ship names. That's a real thing. Name your government system after your favorite ship, I guess. Anyway, the Guili Assembly became incredibly prosperous with mining operations at Mount Tianhong as well as the agricultural industry that took over the Dihua Plains. No, plains, not marsh. Such a large territory can be a bit tricky to protect, so with the help of the Adepti Cloud Retainer, Guizhong created the giant ballista and stationed it in the mountain pass at Mount Tianhong and aimed it at the Lisha province for reasons that no one can seem to explain and I can't figure out. But yeah, the Guili assembly overall was pretty peaceful. Not that that lasted. Around 3,700 years ago, the peace was eventually broken through an act of war. Guizhong, Morax, and the Adepti all fought to protect the Guili plains, but their efforts were in vain. While the outcome of the battle is currently unknown, we do know that the battle ended with a massive flood that brought such severe landslides to the area that the Dihua Plains became the Dihua Marsh. This battle likely marked the beginning of the Archon War in Liyue, and Guizhong was among the first of its casualties. The settlement at the Guili Plains was completely destroyed, so Morax took what was left of his people back south to Old Liwa Harbor, traveling through a storm that lasted for weeks. And still grieving over the loss of Guizhong, Morax was forced to make some very difficult decisions. His people had lost their homes and they were suffering. They prayed to him for help every single day. It's worth pointing out here that Morax at this time was not the wise old grandpa that we know now. He was a bit of a meathead, a bit of a brawny meathead, fists first, words later, right? So it's very sensible to assume that he relied on Guizhong for a lot of the more, you know, thought-heavy aspects of rulership. It's very reasonable to assume that during their joint rulership, Guizhong was probably the one making the most difficult decisions. And without her guidance, he was probably pretty lost. Not to mention the fact that by dying, she broke her promise of joint rulership with him. And that broken promise? The loss of her presence? Caused something to break inside of him, too. In a fit of frustration, he carved a sword from Core Lapis and used it to slice a corner clean off of Mount Tianhong and thereby made a solemn vow. Those who were scattered, he would gather. Those who broke their contract, he would punish. And those who experienced loss would receive justice. Morax gained a new resolve through the death of his dearest friend. He would uphold her dream of unifying their people and he would enact their justice. And he would ensure that promises would always be kept. And that is how he became known as the God of Contracts. For what is a contract but a promise enforced by law? 
New convictions in hand, the first thing Morax did was to properly reestablish the settlement at the foot of Mount Tianhang. He retaught his people how to make homes, he built the Golden House, created Mora as a new standard currency, and oversaw the establishment of the new governing bodies known as the Qixing and the Millilith. And thus, the true city of Liyue Harbor was officially founded. And once his people were properly taken care of, Morax decided to wage war against the other gods of Liyue. In his mind, it was the best way to unify Liyue and keep the peace. But you gotta wonder if there were any ideas of revenge kind of factored into that decision. Either way, this marked Morax's official entry into the Archon War and the start of many, many battles. But some of the other gods in the area were not so keen to, you know, join the fighting. Havria, the goddess of salt, was one of those gods. Morax left Havria alone for the most part, but he was one of the only gods to do so. Being a particularly weak god like Guizhong, Havria did not have the means to fight off her aggressors. She tried to resolve border disputes peacefully, but she ended up in a constant state of retreat. Finally, though, she holed up in an area known as Sol Tere and offered refuge to anyone who was displaced by the war. She presumably managed to hold her position for several centuries, but her people had already begun to realize that she couldn't hold out forever. Some of her followers thought it was best to grant her the mercy of a swift end rather than continue to subject her to the horrors of war. So they killed their god. Her death, however, resulted in a massive explosion of energy that transformed everyone in the general vicinity into salt, and those who managed to flee found their way to Liwa Harbor and sought refuge with the followers of Morax. So that should bring us to Morax's first real notable battle during the Archon War, around 2,600 years ago. For those of you who watched the last video, that should be around the time when Barbados was freeing old Mondstadt. Now this encounter took place between Morax and an evil god that had somehow managed to enslave a young Yaksha named Alatus. This god had somehow managed to take hold of Alatus' weakness, and he forced Alatus to do its evil bidding. Alatus was forced to commit countless atrocities and even ended up eating the dreams of many of his victims, completely against his will. But like many other gods would in the future, this god found themselves facing off against Morax on the battlefield, and despite their control over Alatus and possibly several other powerful Yaksha, Morax defeated them, and in doing so, freed the young Yaksha from his oppressor. Alatus was so grateful to be free that he pledged his service to Morax as a sign of gratitude, for he owed Morax his life. Morax accepted Alatus into his company and granted him the new name Xiao, a name once given to a spirit that suffered much, just like Alatus had. So Xiao and his fellow Yaksha joined Morax in his war efforts. They were among the many to do so, just like the young half-Chilin, half-human, Ganyu. But antagonistic gods are one thing. Plagues and disasters, on the other hand, well, they're not nearly as easy to deal with, and Liwe happened to be full of both. In an effort to stop all these disasters and plagues from spreading and getting even worse, Marcosius decided to sacrifice himself by pouring all of his godly energy back into the land. This actually worked, although it left him without any of his memories and obviously any of his powers. So he decided to do what all gods do when they're completely out of juice. He took a millennia long nap. And you know, several thousand years later, he would wake up still without his memories and most of his wits. And he would end up following a girl that gave him food known as Changling. And she would then give him a new name, Guoba. Yeah, Guoba's a god. Life's strange that way. Anyway, one ally down and the land very slowly recovering, Morax managed to track down a horrible sea monster by the name of Chinksa. Yes, that's the same Chinksa as is Chinksa Village, because that's where it made its nest, and I don't know why you would want to name your village after a giant sea monster, but whatever, we'll go with it. In any case, Chinksa was incredibly 
powerful. And I mean so powerful that even after Morax managed to defeat it, its power still lingered like a big, toxic mass of awfulness that totally poisoned the entire region. To prevent this from spreading, Morax and his companions split the monster's body into five parts and then sealed each one in a different location all around Liwe. The seals not only suppressed the toxic effects of its horrible powers, but it also ensured that the sea monster could never be resurrected. Today, Chinksa is known by the name of Ch. There's a whole quest about it called Ch of Yore. We're going to ignore all of the non-notable battles now, and just mention that several hundred years after this incident, most likely, Morax discovered Ejdaha, a blind bishop buried in the mountains of Nantianmen. Morax grants him the gift of sight and forms a contract with him. Ejdaha agrees not to harm humanity, and in exchange, he gets to live alongside Morax and the Adepti peacefully. Well, I mean, kinda. Ejdaha also joins Morax in battle, so he's mostly living in peace, but also kind of like biting intruders like a big scaly guard dog. He's gotta protect his folks, you know? By this point, Morax has a ridiculous squad of friends and immortal allies backing him up. And just in time too, because a few hundred years after this, another big sea dragon rears its ugly head. Uh, heads? Heads. He has five heads. And a wife. A big, three-headed sea dragon wife. He's living the Ocean King dream. Anyway, this five-headed liquid monstrosity is known as Osile, and Osile and Morax decide to duke it out in the Sea of Clouds, with Morax finally seizing victory and pinning Osile to the ocean floor with his big stone spears. And by doing this, Morax apparently created Yuyun Stone Forest. Okay, but created is probably a bit of a strong word. Guyun Stone Forest's island had to have existed prior to this battle because it's covered in really old buildings that are then covered by Morax's stone spear thing, so I guess he created some islands, but not all of them, and then he made the rest uh, just bigger. Yeah. Anyway, Osile's underneath there. Remember that next time you go to farm or whatever. Osile is the final noteworthy god that Morax fought, and with him gone, Morax was finally able to claim his seat in Celestia and seize the title of the Geo Archon. But his challenges don't end there. I mean, come on, they're never ending. The challenges never stop. The lingering resentment and powers of all of Morax's defeated foes had leached into the land, causing more pain and suffering. So like demon possessions, plagues, disasters, you name it, it's happening, but it's all about the resentment of the gods that Morax had beat up. So what do you do about a whole bunch of old godly grudges? Well, if your name is Morax, you assemble five of the strongest Yaksha. Alatus, Bosatius, Indarius, Bonanus, and Minogius. Their job was to fight the lingering resentment and purge the land of all evil. So that's what they did. But one by one, each Yaksha succumbed to the effects of the fallen god's power. Some of the Yaksha lost their sanity, some turned against each other, and some just disappeared entirely. Until only Alatus, or Xiao, remained. But Xiao wasn't immune to the corruption either. He resisted as long as he could, but even he finally succumbed to it, and he was only saved by the sound of Barbados playing a flute in Dihua Marsh. It calmed Xiao's mind and allowed him to regain his sense of self. And why Barbados was in Dihua Marsh playing a flute, I have no idea, but there he is. Thank you very much for saving the final Yaksha. Even the tone-deaf bard does some good things sometimes. And you know, I can't tell if Xiao is just stubborn or a sucker for punishment because he still continued to carry out his duty of purifying Liwei even after this near-death encounter. Now the rest of the non-Yaksha Adepti decided that when all the fighting was done that there was no more need of them, so they left Liwa Harbor and Mount Tianhung in favor of Juyun Karst since their combat prowess was no longer needed. Ejdaha, however, stuck around. 
but he also kind of suffered some similar effects that, you know, like Xiao went through. Although it wasn't the corruption of the resentment of former gods, it was technically just his mental faculties deteriorating due to erosion, which is an unstoppable force of time. Morax tried to use his powers to help stabilize Ajdaha, but it wasn't that effective. In order to not be a danger to anyone, including himself, Ajdaha decided to isolate himself inside the chasm, allowing the power of the ley lines there to sustain him. But even that was a bit short-lived. The local mining operations in the chasm disturbed the flow of the ley lines, and that caused Ajdaha's condition to get even worse. He went berserk! He attacked the facilities in the chasm, destroying the village of Tiancho in the process. Morax, Mountain Shaper, and Moon Carver were reluctant to fight against an old friend, but they couldn't ignore the danger that he brought to the people and to himself. So they decided to seal him in a domain beneath the tree in Nantianmen instead. 500 years pass, and a new cataclysm is beset upon Liyue. Not a dragon this time, but instead countless abyssal monsters rushing forth from the depths of the chasm. And, well, as much as I'd like to talk about this incident with the same level of detail as I did with Mondstadt, the truth is, there's not much information available to talk about. All we know are a couple of really vague facts. First, the ruins at Dunyu, having been repurposed into a bustling mining city after the Archon War, suffered an unknown disaster. No one will talk about what happened, but the city was abandoned and the survivors fled to Liwe Harbor. Other than that, the only thing we know is that Morax was sworn to secrecy about the events at the Cataclysm, and he even signed a contract about it, with whom is still kind of a mystery, although most people are assuming it's Celestia. That seems perfectly reasonable. Even the events between the end of the Cataclysm and the start of the game are a bit muddy. There are a few events documented, but nothing truly impactful, so I think I'll just leave this here for now. So as you can see, Liwa's history is much longer and a lot less clear-cut compared to some other regions. But I hope I was able to compile the most notable events into something that makes sense. I hope. I get the feeling that Chasm notwithstanding, Liwa is going to see a few expansions over the years, and maybe they'll be able to bring us some more clarity. Or maybe they can just give me more books. I would love some more books. Can I just have some more books? That would be fantastic. But until then, I really can only speculate, and I will be doing a little speculation in a short follow-up video that I will link in the description to this one. The follow-up video will mostly just be a, a compilation of all of the things I noted down while doing research for this video that I couldn't actually confirm through any authoritative source, so it's kind of like a half speculation, half, I don't know, theoretical, archaeological thing. I, whatever, it's, it's a game. Leave me alone. Just stay tuned if you're interested, because uh, there, there's some stuff that'll recontextualize some early leeway history in there. If it's right, anyway, which I can't confirm or deny. In the meantime, I just want to take a minute to thank you all for watching this video! I hope it brought some clarity to Liwa's history, and I definitely hope that you'll stay tuned for the next episode, which will probably be about Inazuma. Now, I rarely ask this, and it is by no means mandatory, but if you're interested in getting updated on the next installment of this series, it's probably a good idea to subscribe and click the bell, but I won't force you. Do it if you want to. So, right, yeah, uh, thanks again for tuning in. I am off to question my own sanity, so I'm just gonna, you know, uh, I'll, uh, catch y'all in the next one. Hopefully. Later. <laughs>